going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store, back where it says horror videos, and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing inquiring minds want to know? I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick incrustations dying on the surface. What the prime time gets. Pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. We've got to return some video tape. Hello, horror hounds, and welcome to the It Slays podcast. I'm your rat king, Rowan. I'm Colton. And it's Jill. And we are back for a very special episode. We say that every month, but this is uh, super special because it's a Patreon pick, and we only do that like once a month. So we are here with a Patreon pick. First, we're going to let Colton explain what a Patreon pick is and how you yourself could possibly make us watch something good, something terrible, I don't know, something medium. Yeah, so how our Patreon picks work is if you are pledged at the the horror hound level on our Patreon, you know, patreon.com slash it slays podcast for, I think it's the period of six months is what we said. I believe so, yes. Yeah, after six months, we'll reach out to you and we'll ask, hey, you know, what, what would you like us to review? And yeah, we'll review whatever your pick is as long as we haven't covered it in the past on the show. So, yeah, if you want to pledge at the $5 amount on Patreon, you can do so at uh, patreon.com slash It Slays Podcast, like our other horror hounds, Holly, Nicholas, Patrick, Mark, Stephen, Joy, Carby, and Dan do each and every month. And speaking of Mark, it was his pick, I, and he uh, he picked a doozy for us. <laughs> he picked something all right. Uh, this is a little weird for me because Mark's a very close personal friend of mine, and obviously we've gone back and forth in the DMs now about, you know, Graveyard Shift, uh, you know, after I watched it. So ultimately, I know why he chose this film already, but now I have to, you know, get you guys and the listeners up to speed. So he was torn between this and 2001's Pulse, but ultimately decided on Graveyard Shift oh. because he he hasn't seen it covered much in the podcast space. Uh, like most of us, he's a huge fan of Stephen King. And just found that the works adapted in this area era, like the late 80s, early 90s, were oftentimes judged too harshly or garnered, you know, a lot of unwarranted poor critical reception. So he thinks Graveyard Shift is worth another look. Uh, He says that it features some great creature effects, uh, some filthy sets that really help sell the setting. And he's not someone who really uses a review rubric. He's one of those on Letterboxd that just logs what he watches and doesn't review it. You know, he's above all that. But he did tell me that he thinks this movie is good. So on our scale, I believe that'd probably translate to a yay. So a big thanks to Mark for being a Patreon supporter and for picking our movie tonight, Graveyard Shift, for us all to discuss. So uh, let's get into the trailer and we'll be back with the synopsis and first experiences. This is the new horror from the mind of Stephen King. This place is infested. That might be the understatement of the year. And the deeper you go. When's the last time you've been to a graveyard? The colder you feel. The hungrier it gets. (laughs) Graveyard shift. Good benefits. Early retirement. Rated R. Starts Friday, October 26th at theaters everywhere. Graveyard Shift was directed by Ralph S. Singleton and written by John Esposito, and the story is as follows. John Hall, a drifter who wanders into a small town in Maine, finds himself in desperate need of a job, so he seeks employment at the community's top business, a large textile mill. He is hired to work the Graveyard Shift overnight until dawn, and along with a few others is charged with cleaning out the old mill's rat-infested basement. At first, this task strikes the workers as simple enough, but as they proceed deeper underground, they soon encounter a winged monstrosity intent on devouring them all. So first experiences, is this our first time seeing Graveyard Shift, or have we seen all the Stephen King adaptations, good, bad, ugly, it doesn't matter. Colton, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I feel like I've seen my fair share of Stephen King adaptations, good, bad, it doesn't matter, you know? Especially like uh, Mark and I, we used to have like a monster movie Mondays where we used to choose a bunch of corny movies to watch like over the course of a year or two. But weirdly enough, I've never seen this one. 
Uh, I do know that it was based on a short story by Stephen King, but I also haven't read the the short story. So I just came into this basically knowing that uh, a lot of people hated it, and I kind of assumed that it had something to do with rats. And uh, yeah, here I am. This is the first time for me. What about you, Rowan? Yeah, so this has been on my radar because I remember being a kid going into uh, video stores and the poster for this being in the video store. It has a great poster, to be fair. It is super iconic, and I really want, uh, like, I need to find a print of it to put up. And this is another one of those. It's the sad tale of Rowan. I bought the, you know, $30, $40 collector edition Blu-ray of Graveyard Shift when it came out. Scream (laughs) Factory put it out. I had never watched it. It just has sat on my shelf. I had heard, like, good and bad things about it. Uh, So I've always wanted to watch it, just never had the time. Yeah, this is definitely my first time seeing it. What about you, Jill? Well, first of all, I'm kind of surprised that you haven't seen it yet since the the artwork is very My Bloody Valentine. Yeah. uh, You know, like, reminiscent. So... Yeah, but no, it's um, first time for me, never heard of it, never saw it before, so yeah, but I did read um, the short story. As did I, Jill sent it uh, to me and I read it. Yeah, I read it the other day and I really liked it. Yeah, maybe when we're discussing the movie, we'll get into some points at which it differs. I never read the short story, so I have no idea personally, but you you should point out some of the differences to me as we discuss. Absolutely. So let's get into the, uh, the rat burger of it all. We know where we're going to start. Our favorite scene and or favorite kill. Jill, why don't you kick us off? Oh, dang. You're really going to give me the honor of claiming the rat surfing scene? (laughs) Oh, baby. That's a big scene. That's a big scene. (laughs) That um, total highlight of the movie for me. uh, Hilarious. Love the song choice. Love these little rats going down this dank water on pieces of wood. Yep. Amazing. Iconic. That's all I got to say. Weirdly enough, that scene, I think, might be an homage to Apocalypse Now. And (laughs) I don't know if we want to get into it right now before we even talked about our favorite scenes, but there's a lot of weird coincidences slash homage in this movie that I think is directly referencing Apocalypse Now. And there's also a scene that I think is ripped straight from Jaws as well. Okay. Yeah, that scene in particular, I think is Apocalypse Now reference. I, I, I believe it. And what's your favorite scene, Orko? For me, <laughs> I, I gotta go with Brogan falling through the stairs, <laughs> which I don't even know if you guys remember because it was such a quick moment. But like, I, I absolutely love like when people fall in movies and there's a scene when Brogan, <laughs> who's like the big guy who's constantly screaming, you know, he's like using the, the hose and he's like holding it like as if it's like a minigun or something, just screaming like he's in Predator or something. And mm-hmm. he tries to escape the basement one time and he just falls through the stairs and when he falls he just keeps falling and then he falls through the floor and then he keeps falling more and then he lands in like the cavern underground and I was just like bursting out laughing like it reminded me of that scene in American Psycho 2 where William Shatner falls out the window that I loved so much and had to put the Lincoln Park oh, over yeah, it this was yeah. like this was the same thing where I was like oh god I, I kind of want to cut this out and just put it up on the <laughs> on the you know on the on the Instagram or something it was it was just great I love that scene obviously there's a lot of scenes in this movie that I think are excellent that I'm sure we'll discuss or you know they're, they're great for their own reasons but I, I just got such a big kick out of Brogan falling through the stairs that I had to say it was my favorite scene what about you Rowan my favorite scene was the exterminator's death Oh, played by an iconic Brad Dorf, uh, yeah. who I just love in everything. But yeah, it was like pretty gnarly. It was like really shocked me. It was like a surprising death. The quick kill of just like the the granite just kind of pushing against his head. You get to see like you know basically the back of his head like just all over the rocks and yeah. And like I said, yeah, just really gnarly, really. Great early '90s practical effect gore, like just, ah, mm-hmm. uh, just loved it, loved it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great scene. I actually rewound that because I didn't understand like the logistics of what exactly happened there, but like the ground sinking in and you know where he was positioned and how did his head get crushed and all this stuff. I was like, <laughs> what's going on here? So I had to rewind that. There's a couple of points in this movie that I had to rewind to kind of figure out what was on the go. Colton but, doing uh, the real work, so you don't have to. <laughs> Listen, I I have a note about Doris. 
Do you guys remember Doris? Oh the yes. Rat? Oh yeah. Do you remember Doris? Oh okay. Doris. All right. So I let let's get into the cold open of this movie, which I think is excellent. Yeah. But I was so confused starting off where, you know, this man, he's talking to Doris the rat. She's sitting on the chair, and then he's like oh Doris you know you're disgusting or whatever and I'm like did Doris intentionally piss on the chair <laughs> what happened here so I had to rewind a couple of times and see like was the chair just naturally wet did the rat intentionally piss on the chair what is happening in this scene um and yeah it seems like Doris intentionally pissed on the chair our guy got angry and then you get that excellent shot of all these rats just being rats just all like eating mm-hmm. and looking but they play menacing music over it and they're all like in the rafters looking down at him mm. and they're on the stairs and whatnot and it, it's like oh it's so corny but it's so good i i, 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 really I love like that. that it's also funny because the rats are rats but some of them are really smart rats and they're always fucking with the people in the facility so i love that oh yeah it was great i hope doris wasn't the one that got sacrificed but i mean it, it certainly is possible but yeah the, like i just thought the intro of this movie like went pretty hard like i was surprised with like it, it just goes on so long it's like probably 10 minutes and this guy's in there like you know the rats are like eating the blood they all kind of descend on him they put him through the loom and all this shit right it, it was it was a great great intro and also uh, i was like oh cool there's gonna be a big rat in this movie and uh <laughs> I was let down. There wasn't a big rat in the movie, but the intro was sick. Like, what do you think of it, Rowan? Yeah, I, you know, it really gave me like, uh, like Night Gallery or Tales from the Crypt, like the show, like maybe Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Like, it gave me those kind of vibes, like, kind of like 60s, 70s horror television, like, which I love. Like, I love that aesthetic. I love that feel. But yeah, it was like, it was so like weird and like funny, but also like, yeah, rats can be like creepy and smart rats are even creepier. What was funny is I never found the rats creepy at any point in this movie. I thought they were always just cute. Like the way, like obviously wow. you can't really direct these rats that well, right? So they're always just being rats and then they're like eating and looking at the camera and how they make them scary is they just play menacing music over it. And it's, it's so great, like all the time throughout the movie. I also love how like angry this guy gets over like what is it like the quota not being met on the wall or whatever it's like have you guys ever been so angry that you just slam your hand against a nail on the wall <laughs> like it, it was just like a That's ridiculous a man thing to do yeah it was just so ridiculous just the beginning it all like started all off and like the rats eating the blood and all this so it's just man oh man the other thing i really liked about it and like i don't know this is gonna sound like i murder people in my spare time or something but I just, I really like the blood on the wall. I, like, it aesthetically looked really good. And yeah. I was just like, this is like a great choice, especially with like the giant machine and feeder. Like, we knew the minute we see this giant machine, oh. you're like, yeah, this guy's done. It doesn't matter what happens. This guy's going in here. Some part of him <laughs> is going in here. A lesser movie would make you wait all the way until the third act in order to see that. But yeah, not Graveyard Shift. You know, we start with that. <laughs> Graveyard Shift knows what the people want and it gives it to them, which absolutely is really awesome because, you know, I was kind of thinking about, you know, we're in we're in 1990. So I'm thinking about like the stand and it and, and the kind of this stuff where. I mean, I've said it is like one of my all time favorites, but, you know, most of these Stephen King adaptations are mostly bloodless, like they're the kills are usually like kind of off camera, just implied because most of this stuff is like television work, a lot of this 90s stuff. So I just I really like that. I was like, okay, like this is not the stand. This is not it. This wasn't for television. Like this is a straight up horror movie. Like give it to me with this, like all together. Like I just find it. It doesn't read for television at all. Like it does feel like an actual movie to me. Now, whether or not the movie's great, it's like we can put that aside. But it does. I feel like people are trying in this movie, which is like. The practical effects, like, we'll get into it, but the the bat is great. Like, the way they shoot it, like, they always make sure it's dark, it's wet. If it's, like, it's close up on its face, like, you don't have a person in the the actual shot, so you can kind of believe that it's larger than what it probably is. The sets, they're all, like, flooded and dirty and gross, and you have, like, dozens of mice and rats running around them. Like, it's all, like, it feels 
larger than what I was expecting, especially for a movie that like most people give like a half star or one star on Letterbox or whatever, right? That I was just like, man, there there is a little bit of heart and soul put into this. And specifically with Brad Dorf. Oh yeah. Uh, I think he's I think he's acting his ass off in this movie. I there's that like, monologue. Yes. So th- that's that's what I want to talk about. The the monologue. Like He's basically doing Quint's speech from Jaws, right? Like, like the <laughs> Indianapolis sinking in the ocean and like the the sharks developing a taste for men and like everyone getting eaten when the you know the boat goes down. And he's there and he's talking about like the rats and the VC, like the the Viet Cong developing, you know, these rats that have a taste for human flesh and he's crying and like <laughs> I'm like, damn, dude. Like he's going for the Oscar in that scene. Like he he's giving it his all. And that's the thing, a lot of these sorts of movies, especially from this era, are like, you know horror movies that are poorly rated, you can find, like, so many people are just completely checked out of the movie. Brad Dorf is 100%, like, giving it his all in this. I don't expect anything less from Brad Dorf. You know, this kind of reminds me, like, his performance. He's in another movie called Death Machine that uh, I highly suggest to anyone. It's like a horror sci-fi hamming it up, but, it, like, you know, he's given, always giving it his all. But, uh... Yeah, I just thought he was, like, really good in this. I I did make a note that said, I wish I had, you know, it's kind of a sad note for me personally, that I wish I had something in my life that I love as much as the exterminator loved killing rats. I literally have the same thing. I said, (laughs) I wish I hated anything as much as Brad Dorf hates rats. So it's similar. You, You took it from the loving approach. I took it from the hateful approach. But, like, I got the exact same note. He's a passionate man. Oh, my God. Like when he's just screaming, you know, spread the word, fucker, and killing one of them or spraying the the hose down the chimney and going, adios, motherfuckers, like constantly cursing and like getting such glee out of like taking out these rats. That's Um, real dad behavior. Oh, yeah. There's also the one thing where he goes like, you know, there's only one way to deal with their kind on their own terms. And then he shows an ankle holster with a gun in it. And I'm like, what are the are the rats using guns? Like, how is like him using like an ankle holster gun dealing with the rats on their own terms? Like, it literally makes zero sense. But there's numerous lines in this movie like that that just like got a kick out of me. I also love that, you know, his uh, his like terrier and he's just like it's a rat terrier and of course he's trained the dog just to sniff rats out and kill them it just made me think about uh, i don't know if you guys ever saw best in show and they uh uh eugene levy's character they like their dog is a terrier and they have like a song called everyone loves a terrier and uh I, I just kept thinking about that song whenever the Terrier was on because it's like this really like sweet, silly song. And I was like, they should play that. Speaking of songs, I want to say just to back it up a bit. Uh, we talked, you know, how much we love that opening scene. Also, for some weird reason, I really, really enjoyed the credits, the opening credits. Yeah. yeah. It had like this creepy music that I thought was like mm-hmm. really effective. You know, I was like, this this is giving me 80s, 90s like creepy music. And I really enjoyed it more so than I think most people should. So did you stick around for the ending credits, though? Did you oh, sit through no, those? I didn't. Literally the worst ending credits song of all oh, time. No. It's literally just a fat bass line, like plucking a bass, punctuated with a bunch of quotes from the movie. Oh, shit. So they keep going like the graveyard shift. And that's like <laughs> plucking a guitar and then it goes the graveyard shift again. And like it's just all these all these weird quotes like when's the last time you've been to a graveyard or like breaks over like all this shit just pu- like over like a plucking bass guitar. Um, I will say Ralph the rat got a special thanks. I was looking to see if there was going to be any names named rats. And then the very last song of the entire movie, like when the credits are over, it holds on a black screen for a second and it says, no more, no more, no. And then the song ends and it's literally the worst ending credits of all time. Jill is cracking up. You have to go back and listen to it. It was so good. It's so bad. It's literally like the worst ending credits I've ever heard. They should have ended it with the woman saying, wouldn't mind his boots resting under my bed. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Shia Twain reference. That that character was very mic coded. I wish he was here to discuss. I know. uh, (laughs) That was his favorite character, probably. Oh, 100%. 
you know, and I I feel like since these are kind of, you know, bonus episodes for the people, these are the kind of episodes I want people to listen to, to, to really find out how we make the sausage of the podcast. Cause here is a little, little note that some people may not know, but stream screams, the scream is actually from this movie in our intro. No. No it way. Is. Cool. is it is it from when he says the graveyard shift and then there's a scream? It's like a woman screaming and uh, Yeah, so so I have a quote where it's it, it we haven't talked about this guy yet, but it's a uh, Warwick. Oh, you know, we'll like the, talk about oh him. My God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll save my thoughts for a second. But it's when he's talking to the main character, which I forgot his name right now, John. He's talking to him and he says like, you know, it's the graveyard shift, and he's like saying like it, it's with this menace, and it literally hard cuts to like a woman screaming, yeah, and it's like once again, it. this movie knows what it's doing because like everybody knows what the graveyard shift is. It's not that scary to have to work an overnight, but like they cut to like a woman like screaming at the top of her lungs. So I wonder if it's that scream. That I, I, have I to just go back know it's listen. from yeah I know it's from this film, so wow. there you go a little little sneak peek in how <laughs> uh, we make it. Yeah, I mean we might as well have the Warwick conversation. <laughs> what what do we think about Warwick in this movie? Piece of shit. Okay, could you guys understand what he was the saying? Accent half the time? was wild. The accent was <laughs> I don't know so what he was wild. Doing. What? Yeah. Was he trying to be Polish? I don't know, because at one point I was like, this sounds like a really bad Christopher Walken impression. But then like he totally switches it up and doesn't sound like that ever again. So I, I thought he just literally had a weird voice. I don't know. I've never listened to the guy before, but to me, it was just literally like I thought he was just <laughs> him because it sounded like so much of his dialogue was ADR, like recorded after the fact that I was just like, OK, like when they were recording him, was it a really bad recording session? Was it just like, oh, when we can understand him, it's ADR, like what it is. There were so many scenes. The w- main one I'm thinking of is like when he kind of uh, storms in and basically like sexually harasses the employee at the end <laughs> that mm-hmm. it's just like I can't understand like 80% of what this guy is saying and I'm just vibing I'm not turning on subtitles I'm just watching it I'm like <laughs> I, I'm not getting anything out of this this guy is just unhinged and you know what I, he was a, a necessary villain I did enjoy him just because he was so sleazy he was like so dirty and I you know I was thinking because you can probably already tell this early into it. Like I may have really connected with this movie and uh, vibe oh, with wow. it, but I was thinking of, you know, it's funny. We talked about the poster. Jill brought it up, but I was thinking of my bloody Valentine. And I was thinking, I think one of the reasons is, you know, in uh, Nova Scotia, specifically Cape Breton, like where, my bloody valentine is set was a mining town and this like has that like small town mining field and especially like you know if you notice like the convenience store in the town is warwick convenience like basically this company owns everything in the town so i like i just i thought that was a really cool detail that kind of made it relatable to where i'm from well yeah like the blue collarness of this movie like it's it's not something that you see in too many horror movies because once again your cast is usually like a bunch of teenagers or you know they're not just like mill workers most of the time it's not like the most interesting group of characters usually to choose right like i could think like yeah it's it's probably like alien or aliens has a bunch of people that are essentially space truckers you know and yeah. i think the third act of this movie does kind of turn into aliens a little bit with everyone down in the the tunnels just walking around getting picked off looking for the the bat but it is like it's an interesting choice it, de- it definitely has like a small town vibe and it is just, it's nice to see a bunch of people that actually need to work for a living and basically like, well, listen, I know, I understand it's fucked up. My, my factory's flooded and there's a giant bat in here, but I mean, it's not, I, I got to pay the bill somehow, you know? I definitely agree with you on the fact that this should probably be like on the level of alien and considered, uh, <laughs> okay. I, I feel like I'm being misquoted a little bit, but, uh, Jesus. You know. Yeah. Speaking of money, I, I thought it was really funny. Like they do the, you know, the, whole hype up where Warwick's doing like you know oh you went to college college boy and he's talking about well I got some overtime for you and all this stuff and like really hyping him up for this job and I was like but the job he selected him to do was basically just be a janitor in this basement 
but he yeah. he was making it like, oh yeah, like this is you're moving on up, and now you're a janitor. I think he was just being a prick. I don't think he has a high. I do think he was being a prick, education. and this is where yeah. I really found reading the story. It worked better in the story because the story, mm-hmm. although it's not long, it's what thirteen pages. Like the story. Throughout the whole thing, you're getting the vibe like like he's always talking to John Hall and calling him college boy and like insulting him or like belittling him where I felt with this, he was he's doing a prick. It, he was a <laughs> prick, but like it didn't seem like he was necessarily being like malicious just to him. It was like kind of everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah in the story, I think it's more so like specifically this targeted guy. because of his education. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, I never got that. I just got he was a sleaze, you know? In the story, it's like a whole different um kind of dialogue of what's happening. Like you have this guy, he's a drifter, he just goes to like one place to work and he changes it up every year. And then you got this foreman guy, Warwick, who's like always picking on him, like we just said. Um, you know, for having an education and uh, just roaming around, basically. And he becomes like the real villain, really, uh, besides the rats. But they kind of band together against the rats. And in the end of the story, actually, um, I think Hall, who the main character is, yeah. he pushes Warwick like into the rats or like the big fucking rat and then uh, tries to run away. But then he gets taken down by the other rats and dies. And so it's a completely different ending to that movie. And, you know, it's more like a personal thing against the two of them, like a rivalry. Which is interesting because in this movie, I think it's a little bit more just he's has it out for everybody. But yeah. if yeah. it was a personal thing. It would work better for my Apocalypse Now reading of this movie. Oh, oh there shit. There you go. Which I, I, I think Warwick is a stand in for Marlon Brando's character <laughs> in this movie. And our guy, uh, John, who I keep forgetting his name, I think he's a uh, Martin Sheen's character and kind of descending into the heart of darkness. There's a lot of weird references to Apocalypse Now in this. Like, for example, Warwick putting all the, you know, the mud on his face, for example. Yeah. You know, like, it, yeah. it's like, what is that off the bottles? None of us know what it is. Like, is Shit. it oil? Is it dirt? Is it mud? What is it? But he puts it all over his face, similarly in Apocalypse Now. They descend further and further in. They keep losing people. And, like, they basically go crazy by the end of the movie. It ends in a knife fight. You know, it, it's very much like when I was watching this, the, the, the cut to the rat surfing. Essentially how that's used in Apocalypse Now is they're showing like horrific war crimes and then they do like a hard cut to all the Americans celebrating and surfing and they have surf music playing and they're all chilling out. This movie, it winds up being like someone is murdered by like the the bat, right? Like off screen, hard cut to all the rats just surfing and hanging out, you know, vibing. And I was just like, I think this movie is trying to do an Apocalypse Now thing. There's also, like, the scene where, like, they're kind of uh, John and I forget her name in the movie, but they're, like, wading through the water and they kind of go up, like, really high as well. Like, there's all these shots that remind me of Apocalypse Now. Now, I've only seen Apocalypse Now once. I'm not an expert. But as I was watching it, I was like, I think this, I think they're going for this, especially with that whole, like, Vietnam War monologue early in the movie. And since so much of this movie is, like, tongue-in-cheek, I think they were going for it. It's hilarious. I agree with you, Colton. This movie should be put up there with Apocalypse <laughs> Now. Also. So it should. So far, it should be compared to Jaws, Aliens, and Apocalypse Now. Yeah, okay. when, when you mention well, those, you also have to mention Graveyard Shift. Graveyard Shift. Wow, uh, wow. As this some is, of the great movie. movies of our time. <laughs> When you guys were watching this movie, did you get thirsty at all? Like, did you feel like you needed to crack open a an ice cold Diet Pepsi or a Mountain Dew? Or I was. You know, I, I, need that I ran out. Oh you no! Ran out? I had none in my house, and it was making me thirstier. Wow. I I wonder. Do you think this was paid for product placement, or do you think it was actually just? I hope it doing? was paid for product placement. I hope so too, because it that makes it be. funnier somehow. Because I don't know how long they just linger on shots of, of like a Diet Pepsi like brand facing the camera perfectly in this movie, but it was enough that I was like, I need to go to the fridge. You know, I got to crack one open. It worked. Oh yeah, it always works for me. If anyone knows me, they know Rowan loves a good DP. So I definitely. <laughs> Always get into the die Pepsi. I did. That, that means some other things on different parts of the internet, but yeah, I'm, the, I'm happy for I you, mean, Rowan. Yeah, I 
I, I like to, you know, refresh myself with DPs all the time. So Good for you. Proud of you. And yeah, so I did have a question for Colton, because I did see Colton's letterbox review, uh, which said, you know, uh, about Diet Pepsi saving the day. So I wanted yes. to know, with the product placement, with this movie mm-hmm. making you thirsty, is this movie not a homage to Nova Scotia, but one to Newfoundland. Is this somehow kind <laughs> of the greatest Newfoundland horror movie ever made because of the Diet Pepsi connection? Yeah, because we got the Pepsi factory, I guess, or at least fa- Pepsi prominently pe- placed in the movie. We love yeah, I mean, Pepsi. I'm, I'm just losing my words, Rowan, just thinking about this. Yeah, I mean, we got some funny accents in there. Yeah. You know, we got mm-hmm. blue yeah. collar people. Mm-hmm. We got Pepsi. All we need is like a codfish, and we're basically yeah. there. Yeah. So and I, basically I need to go and have a, a an iconic Newfoundland movie. So <laughs> the rats yeah. could be moose. All right, sure. Yeah, let's just go with that. <laughs> the rats are vermin, just like moose. We and, got a real uh, moose problem. Or also are they deer, mice? You're because to our Warwick says they're episode. mice. Right. That's what I was yeah. saying. That, so I was wondering about that. Is it supposed to be rats or mice the entire movie? Supposed to be rats. Okay, well. And what I mean, is a bat but a rat with wings? 100%. That was intentional. It was great. In in the story, is it a, a bat or is it a giant rat? It's a mutated rat, which is a bat, but they actually say, what is a rat but a bat, or what is a bat but a rat with wings? Oh, okay, so it's not that clever. Okay. It, it's fine. a line from the story. Wow. It's actually really <laughs> interesting that a 13-page like short story into this, you know, this is what an hour and twenty something minutes. I think like an hour and twenty eight or something. Yeah, eighty nine minutes. Yeah, we gotta talk about that. I think it's really interesting. I thought it was a pretty good adaptation. Like, I was like, this is kind of pretty true to the story, which is weird because when you think about most Stephen King things, it totally isn't. Like, but I thought like the tone. Everything of the from the story, like definitely in the story, these guys, as they kind of descend into the basement and find out there's another level, like you see these men unraveling in the story, just like they kind of unravel in this to find another another cavern. I feel like I'm watching a killer clowns from outer space where they're like another door another door is basically just that except another cavern another like in apocalypse now and they keep going further and further down the river and they're like another war crime another atrocity of war you know it's Jesus. jill um, you were shaking your head you don't yeah. think this is a good adaptation of this the story I no because i read the story mistake number one i read it before i watched the movie and i love the story it was a fun little horror story 13 pages really short I think it would have made a great creep show episode, um, you know, and a lot of the creep show episodes are Stephen King. Uh, well, he worked on the show, but one of them was a direct Stephen King adaptation, Grey Matter. And I think if they would have done something like this, uh, Graveyard Shift, in 20 minutes, they would have executed it and hit all the notes on the story, shut up, Rowan. They would have hit them all perfectly, but they were trying to really flesh this out for like a feature horror film. And I think they were doing too much. And it really took away from me the simplicity of it just being a, a cool little monster story when they're trying to add, you know, all these other elements to it. Like uh, the girl character, I'm not saying she shouldn't be there. She was not in the story. Jill hates women. (laughs) I do not. I do not. (laughs) Extra, extra. Um, And it's just a different vibe. Uh, I I think the vibe of the story is very like, you know, uh, I mean, they're both very blue collar oriented, but I think the story is much more simple. It's like these people have to work on July 4th weekend for overtime and they have a deadline to clean this basement, but they find that it's infested with rats and then You know, they get fucking destroyed by the rats. And I think it's just a much more simple story. And I like how fun and simple that was. And I feel like the movie kind of dragged on for me. And it was making me kind of bored at times. Because I was like, why are we adding all this? Wow. Extra shit. Well, I got a question for you. Was there Chekhov's Diet Pepsi can in the short story? No, but in the beginning and throughout, there there was can throwing. The, but uh, there it was did a not different specify. brand. Well, it said the brand. I didn't recognize the name. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. Diet it, Pepsi. it started with a Z. Yeah. yeah, it was like 
So I think it must have been made up or something. Probably. Mm. Yeah, because that was also like a crazy moment for me. Because obviously I was watching this movie. I was like, yeah, this is dumb product placement, obviously. They're spending a lot of time loading up the slingshot with the cans and, you know, fire them at the rats. And you get, you know, you even have one of the characters saying, like, sure beats nailing them with soda pop, you know, or whatever. Right. It's just silly shit. Like they keep referencing these cans. And I'm like, oh, man, oh, man. Diet, you know, Pepsi opened their wallet for this. I was like, this is a huge product placement. You know, mm-hmm. there was probably probably a commercial campaign and everything. And then in the third act, the fact that the diet Pepsi can comes back and it's like, it's, it's how the main character survives and defeats the bat. (laughs) And it's edited in such a crazy way where it's like, you show the diet Pepsi can in the slingshot, slowly taking aim, slow motion reaction shots. It's flying through. I was on the edge of my seat. Oh my God. It was just, it was crazy. Like just like the timing on it. Like you could have easily just like cut that with him missing and it'd be like the funniest thing ever. Like it, it was just, but instead it was this crazy moment where they paid off all this like product placement for the whole movie. I, I was just, I was clapping. You know? I probably woke Exilia up while she slapped. Cause when it hit the button, I just yelled, fuck yeah. And I had my headphones <laughs> on. I was just like, oh yeah. <laughs> We were, we were standing up and clapping at that moment. <laughs> oh, was just, I was so excited. It, it, it's crazy. I, I just, you know, I, I didn't expect it. That was a genuine shock in this movie that the product placement was motivated and paid off. Sure was. It was crazy. So uh, what, what did you guys think of the actual monster design? Like the actual effects of this. I thought it was it was pretty impressive. So initially, I was just disappointed that it wasn't a giant rat. You know, uh, I think there's that uh, Cabinet of Curiosities movie, I think, has a big rat, which I thought this was going to kind of be, you know... I, I figured that would have been, like, homaging this or something, right? So I was expecting it to be a big rat. But the first time when the person kind of gets, you know, the, the bat wing comes across and their face is pressing through it, I was just like, damn, that's actually pretty good looking. Like, I'm impressed. Like, I, like mm-hmm. once again, I was like, uh, I thought this was going to be low budget. And then there was stuff like one of the characters lighting the lighter and then, like, kind of the camera panning over a little bit and then, like, the bat, like, bursting its face out and it's all wet and gross. And I'm like, shit okay this is pretty good i I was impressed with the bat i thought it looked good basically the whole movie and even when it it kind of like gets warwick and like wraps its wings around it you can tell like it was cut and framed in such a way that like you don't see the bat's head and body in there it's mostly just the wings and the wings look so good but if you put it all together it probably wouldn't work that well but the way like they were very tactful with how they shot this creature and i thought it always looked good i i liked all the close-ups of like its milky eye or like its claws or how the 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 wings actually looked like what you know the membrane of what a wing would look like and on a bat it was just it was good altogether. like not even being like cheeky or poking fun it was just a good creature design i yeah. thought it was good mm-hmm. and lots of details too yes it was just very well done and i, I also love just like <laughs> Warwick screaming, you know, we're going to hell together. <laughs> and then he just instantly dies. Like, just like, that's it. You know, this is so good. I was going to say, I, I also agree with uh, what Mark was saying about it is I really did like a lot of the the setting and the backgrounds, I, especially like when they kind of drop into like the, the magnificent huge cavern it's like a painted yeah. background it's like a final boss level they all drop down it's like this yeah. is where we're gonna have the knife fight which is crazy i can't believe jane just gets stabbed and that's it you know it's <laughs> insane but yeah where it's like obviously the painted dr- uh, backdrop with like you know all the the cavern but then it pans up and you could see like a little hole through where you could see like almost like the mausoleum on the hill or whatever yeah. it is there the factory or whatever it is it's it's so cool like it reminds me of obviously like the haunted house on the hill like it's you know that's clearly what it's paying homage to but it's very well done it's kind of interesting because it's like a familiar but yet odd setting just because like i i can't i can't think of another horror that is set in like this kind of textiles clothes factory yeah wool factory and it's just like it's so interesting because there's like you know even like the machine that that you know ends up killing the giant rat but kills the guy in the beginning like the loom yeah yeah like it's just like interesting machinery you don't normally see in a movie and it was just like just like really unique setting and really claustrophobic and i really liked it everything looked really yucky and gunky when they're spraying it Mm -hmm. down and yeah i just like i really really liked the set design in this i thought it was also really funny when you had like the piles of bones like you know where (laughs) 
<laughs> you're talking about the set design when Warwick he finds that falls down the mine shaft and they pull him out of like a comically large pile of bones where I'm like <laughs> like yeah that's great set design you know I'm surprised they never put like the xylophone in as they were like walking over the bones or something you know it was good shit I did have a question for you I, I was curious yeah. that I was thinking about as as this goes on do you think Warwick knew about the monster in there because he all like I found that he he always seemed like he kind of knew there was something up like he seemed to know it was connected to the cemetery and like he just always had this hint that he knew something was wrong people were dying i think that's basically what he knows i think where you said something is wrong i think he knows something is wrong people are vanishing or they're only showing up for one shift and going away but i don't think he knew the extent that it was like a giant bat for example right like i, I think he think knew so there's either. something weird on the go but he doesn't know explicitly what because if if that was the case he probably would have been far more sheepish about even you know heading underground through the caverns and all that stuff right if he knew that there's gonna be a huge ass bat just waiting for him right i want to ask a question is there a more dangerous combination than women and stairs because i don't know if you noticed but two of our heroines in this movie get taken out by stairs or at least injured by stairs oh yeah this is true one, one of them she you know she she trips she's coming down the stairs she falls down gets like brutally like beat up like i couldn't believe it like literally like wrist broken sliced across the chest bleeding head <laughs> like like it's a crazy fall down the stairs so much so that she's just helpless and that the rats just come and eat her alive and then the other one jane she's just coming down the stairs misses step hurts her ankle and then she has to be carried by john for the rest of the movie or at least like brought along so just wondering like jill is that something in your everyday life that you're fearful of you know stairs <laughs> uh, i'm accurate? a clumsy person so yeah but i'm wondering if that was a choice just because they didn't want uh you know the woman that they put into this movie to get like hurt or killed for a more like violent reason you know what i mean and it's just like a mistake and then the, the fucking rats come and eat them it, it i was don't just, know when i was watching it it was just i was like that is a gnarly fall down the stairs and then when i was watching gnarly. it again i was like wait jane just fell down the stairs too right. there's only a couple of women in this movie and they both get you know injured by falling down the stairs i mean jane survives but i mean it's you know, it's a, a bump along the journey to her ine inevitable death eventually. I got a funny fact for you here. Uh, as I was exploring Letterboxd after I watched this, David Andrews, who is the actor that plays John Hall, our lead, I just mm -hmm. thought it was an interesting fact that he's kind of a apparently horror legend. Because if you read his biography, it says he set his career off in style by starring in 1984's horror classic, A Nightmare on Elm Street. And when you click on A Nightmare on Elm Street and find David Andrews, I just want to let you know he's basically on the bottom of the list as a background actor. And that is <laughs> the biggest Wikipedia flex I have ever seen <laughs> to say that he starred in A Nightmare on Elm Street. That's awesome. No, I never knew that, but I'm, I'm glad I know that now. But uh, yeah, and I just thought it was interesting. I looked up uh, Ra Ralph S. Singleton, the director, who I had no idea who that was. Only movie he ever directed. Really? Yeah. This? Yeah, this is it. Well, I, I guess it probably got terrible, you know, critical reception and probably made no money. So I guess it makes sense. But so the amazing thing about, you know, the collector's edition of this is there's like tons of interviews. They interview him. They okay. interview all the actors, all that kind of stuff. Sick. I didn't watch them all. I did watch the one with him. Uh, I said before we recorded, it was kind of funny that uh, Ralph S. Singleton must be from a similar area as Donald Trump. Because their voice sounds exactly the same. They have the same, like, gestures and movements. I was like, they must be from, like, the same part in New York. It, it's pretty funny. If you close your eyes, you think 
Donald Trump just directed Graveyard Shift, which might would wow. also be incredible. That that would be I'd watch that as well. That'd be a, good lord. You know, that wouldn't even have to be a Patreon pick. But <laughs> it, it's interesting because I assume you know he kind of did this to try out directing. He but he never wanted to be a director. He said he uh, wanted to be a production manager. That's what he still is, and like he's been production manager. Like I was looking like huge movies, like massive movies like he's going on like 30 year career and basically uh the reason he got this movie was because Stephen King really liked him and he was a, pr- a producer on Pet Cemetery Part 2 and yeah Stephen King liked him and like he sold this for like $2,300 2800 yeah. bucks. I mean, he didn't know that he had a fucking multi-million dollar story going on here, so I can't blame him. You know, yeah, just a little fun fact. I thought it was kind of funny that this is the only thing he's done, and I think if you bat one for one, that's that's 100%. So that's Pretty good, yeah. I mean, it's better than <laughs> a lot of directors. Uh, did you guys have any other notes, or are we good to get in the rating this? Mm-hmm. I think I think we're good, yeah. Yeah, I think if there's ever a film that we we choose to do another episode on, this is in the contentions. I, well, I guess real quick, did you guys get scared by the skeleton jump scare in this movie? <laughs> there's a part where literally the movie just treats it as like they're just like going through the cavern and like a skeleton rolls over and like reveals itself and it's like they do like the whole like big horror jump scare moment i'm just like bro it's just a spooky skeleton <laughs> like it's just from home depot I, I love this shit it was just so silly it just reminds me of like indiana jones or something right like when that happens so let's land the plane on this one i guess if you are new to the show, our rating system is nay, okay, yay, or slay. Jill, what would mm-hmm. you rate Graveyard Shift? Ooh, the pressure is on. I'm going to give Graveyard Shift a uh, okay, an okay because <laughs> I liked it. It was fun. Um, I like the atmosphere, uh, the blue collar thing, the textile factory. I thought that was cool. I love the monster being a mutant giant rat bat thing. And uh, I really like the story. My uh, big mistake, though, was reading the story before I watched the movie. I should have done it the other way around, maybe, and I would have maybe enjoyed the movie more because I just kept comparing it and it lost some of the magic for me. But yeah, I'll give it an okay. Uh, what about you, Rowan? I have to give it a yay. I have to give it a yay. I mean, if I was a big dick, I'd give it a slay. But I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I I feel like I'm going to give it a yay. Everyone knows it's a slay. We already said it's up there with Apocalypse Now, that kind of stuff. Like, this is an Academy Award winner, if I've ever seen one. For Brad Dorf. I mean, he was, Brad he was acting his ass off. I think this is the <laughs> second Brad Dorf. I can't believe this is only the second horror movie we've ever reviewed with Brad Dorf. Brad Dorf also in Eyes of Laura Mars. And surprisingly, we've never done a Chucky movie. So, yeah, I, I love this. I had so much fun with this. I thought it, like, zipped along. At no point was I bored. Uh, like, everything, there was always something to laugh at or just, like truly be like this is amazing what am i watching it looks fantastic like you know for a movie that like you said colton like i the first thing i do before i watch it i'm on letterbox like what's this average rating on this and i'm like oh boy this isn't gonna be too good and i i couldn't believe it i was like man i this is better than this might be better than anything i've watched new this year like this is <laughs> that good i really really like this and this is oh, going shit. to go into like my regular rotation now like, just give it a sleigh no just I, give it's it not a sleigh it's a yay with like <laughs> a, a sleigh in my heart i guess okay but this is one that like I'm going to tell people about if they haven't seen it, I'm going to sit them down and like, I feel like you can have a lot of fun with this in a group of people. Uh, what about you, Colton? What are you giving it? Oh, this is a yay from me as Fuck well. Yeah, I have yes. I have to give it a yay. It was, I was expecting it to be bad and I was expecting it to be like so bad it's good. But 
I think a lot of the writing and stuff in this movie is self-aware. I think they know what sort of movie they're making where it's like kind of like a B-movie creature feature. But I, it's not like so B-movie or so like, you know, like such a bad production where you can just tell like it's incredibly cheap and everyone's checked out. People were actually trying to make a movie with this. Like as we've mentioned, obviously, the creature effects are good. A lot of the set designs are good. They have a huge painted backdrop. A lot of it is just really fun. There's good kills in it. We never even talked about, you know, some of the kills, but it, it's it's all around just a good time. It flies by. And once again, Brad Dorf just acting his ass off. But most importantly, I am a Diet Pepsi man. I love oh, Diet Pepsi. That's right. And it was crazy to see Diet Pepsi factored into this movie in such a big way. And uh, yeah, it was just, it's a, it's a yay from me. You know, Chekhov's Diet Pepsi can is insane. Uh, what I will say is the ending credit song is a hard nay. Um, <laughs> you should definitely not listen to that. It's an awful song, but, you know, the rest of the movie, uh, yay. It was a good time. I, I don't understand why this is, you know, so maligned and so hated. I thought it was good. So two yays and an okay. I, mean, I think that's that's somewhat fair. Right? That's pretty good. Yeah, that's that's pretty good for this movie. I think. Yeah, I think I, that's I, generous. I think the only so. thing that could make it, you know, reasonable is three slays, but that's fine. We're uh, you know Mike would give this a fucking slay. I mean, I don't know if he would, but uh, <laughs> I don't think he prob- so. Or a yay, but if the rats all had little wigs on, it would one hundred percent be a slay. For him. Yes. I, I, I think there would need to be a little bit more attitude in the movie, I think, you, you know. <laughs> and if you're not doing so already, you can follow us on our socials at It Slays Podcast. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Slasher, Letterbox, Threads, Blue Sky. If there's a social media, we're probably there at It Slays Podcast. And if you want to support the shows like our horror hounds, Holly, Nicholas, Patrick, Mark, Stephen, Joy, Carvey, and Dan, gain access to the Patreon-exclusive show, Stream Screams, hosted by Jill, and get episodes of our main show 48 hours early, be sure to head on over to patreon.com slash podcast and choose whatever tier works best for you. Rowan, you got to try and find what that surf song is. Oh, yeah, to I got to get the it. Playlist. I'll it's get the it. Sharkula theme song. I'll find it. I will find it. But yeah, so go to Spotify, go to the It Slays Podcast horrific playlist. If you have any problems finding it, you can go to any of the social media that Colt mentioned and go into the bio, click the link tree link, and it will take you directly to the playlist. We upload licensed music or scores from horror movies we reviewed or iconic horror movies or just horror movies we love so go on there and get your spooky music on and hopefully i can get some music from graveyard shift on there so i can bang yes. out to it and i <laughs> nice. think <All> right. <laughs> first dp now banging out yeah, all right yeah, banging, it, banging out with dp so uh wow 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 yeah i think that is everything as always, thank you for all the support. Yeah, and thanks thanks to Mark for uh, choosing this great movie. Yeah. I think the, our next Patreon pick is probably going to be Steven's pick. So, Steven, if you happen to be listening to this, uh, we might not be reviewing it in December just because we have a pretty stacked month already with having to record a couple of things back-to-back with the holidays coming up. But in the new year, you will be our first Patreon pick for sure. That's right. So you think of something because you've got like a high bar now with Graveyard Shift. Uh, I, I don't even know if our normal picks can overdo that one. So, yeah, thank you for all the support. We'll be back. I am your humble host, Rowan. It's, uh, I don't know, the big cheese, Colton. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I was trying to think of a rat, a rat-inspired one. I don't know. It's Diet Pepsi aficionado, Colton. And by it's Joe. Show's over. Yeah. The graveyard shift. No more! No more! We're going to expand our weekly video segment to take you into the back shelves of your local video store. Back where it says horror videos and where kids are devouring some awful films that we call the video nasties. Are you freebasing? Inquiring minds want to know. I have to break free from this culture of mechanical reproductions and the thick encrustations dying on the surface. What the prime time gets. Pain, I can assure you, will be exquisite. As for our deaths, come with me and be immortal. We have such sights to show you. We've got to return some video.